I'd just like to say what a proud day it is for us today, first of all, to see you all here. There are about 140 of you from different institutions in the UK. There are students here, there are professors, specialists, lecturers from different universities. And we're all here gathered today to mark the launch of a new centre of research in Reading, research and teaching. It's our centre for film aesthetics and cultures. And um, to mark that too, we have uh, the great honour of having the eminent philosopher Jacques Rancière here to give us an inaugural lecture on cinema and the frontiers of art. And Jacques Rancière no, needs no introduction, though he will get that in a moment from Lucia Najib, who is the director of the centre. But I'd just like to say a personal word of appreciation to Jacques Rancière for having made the journey to us and having honoured us by launching this centre in this way. We, we deeply appreciate that and we're also looking forward to your lecture and the questions that will follow. And without more ado, I'd like to hand over to Lucia. Thank you. Hi everybody, it's so wonderful to be here today. Um, it's like a dream for me come true. Um, and uh, obviously I need to start with thanks, uh, first of all, to my beautiful, wonderful colleagues in the Department of uh, Film, Theatre and Television who joined their forces to put all these things together and the technical side of it, the preparation of the theatre, the corridor, everything else. And I had, in the end, very little to do because they were helping me without my needing to ask. So thanks very much indeed for uh, your collegiality and support throughout. Um, also, obviously, to all uh, my colleagues who responded to my call to join us um, in the study of film within the Center for Film Aesthetics and Cultures, we had a fantastic response from people from different faculties, different schools. They are all one, uh, working together, and um, I dare say as enthusiastic as I am, and I'm, I'm really happy that this is working in that kind of way. Um, my third thanks goes to Hugo Tucker and the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. He has been really wonderful with his support and um, uh, whenever we found obstacles, he made sure to minimize those ob obstacles and um, give his total support. And uh, um, maybe he will be angry at me for telling that, but he, um, he uh, put his return from Miami one day ahead so that he could pick us up at the airport, join us there. He hasn't slept since. And he brought uh, Rancière and myself from uh, Heathrow to here in his own car. So he's a real darling. I just uh, can't say, uh, I can't t thank him enough. Um, I also need to think, thank uh, Professor Steve Mythen, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for International <laughs> and External Engagement, who was also extremely supportive, including some financial help that complemented the, uh, the grants that we got from the, the Faculty of Arts. Um, uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to attend today. Uh, he had prior commitments, but I know he's here in spirit with us. Um, last but not least, my gratitude goes to Professor Jacques Rancière, who managed to fit this event into his extremely busy agenda. He also arrived from the States. He's going on a tour to the Balkans um, in, in a moment. And uh, he, um, after three years' insistence, he finally said okay to my invitation, and I'm really proud of it. And more to come uh, in terms of gratitude in a minute. But for now, I need to introduce um, the reason for this event, which is CFAC, uh, um, an ac uh, acronym that stands for Center for Film Aesthetics and Cultures. And its ambition is to be a center of international excellence in research and teaching of film, both with regard to its medium-specific qualities and its inherent interdisciplinary and intercultural properties. 
endowed with an outward facing ethos, CIFAC will be a catalyst of expertise is being already in film at the University of Reading. CIFAC understands aesthetics, and here is where we really connect with uh, Professor Rancière's thought. Uh, it understands aesthetics in its broadest sense as an important branch of philosophy, as style and beauty pertaining to art, as a mode of cultural experience, and as sensory pleasure connecting filmmakers and film spectators. It proposes culture as the local for human interaction and improvement, and as the necessary background for the analysis of any aesthetic subject or object, most no notably film, whose intercultural aspect derives from its own nature as an industrial and transnational medium. CIFAC will investigate the ways in which film reflects the aesthetic politics inherent in the specificities of the medium, as well as the cultural struggles and gains deriving from film's interactions with different systems, practices, and interests. Um, we are going to be holding a number of events. Um, we are going to hold seminar series, prestige lectures, like this one today, although it's going to be hard to match the, the magnitude of this event, but we will try. We are going to contribute to MA teaching, and we are going to host a PhD and postdoctoral training um, um, among other things. I'm very pleased to welcome our first postdoctoral fellow who is joining us today, Igor Kristic. I hope I pronounced his name all right, and he's there. Hello, Igor. He flew from Germany just to attend this event today, and we are very thankful for that. Um, uh, our website is nearly ready, nearly ready to go. Lucy is there. She's helping us uh, frantically in um, putting this website together, and I'm hoping that uh, in a week or so we will be able to um, officially name uh, the uh, URL of this new website where we are going to report on our events. Uh, talking about publications, um, I would like to announce um, a, a book series that will be connected with the center. It's called Thinkers and Cinema. And um, it's my great pleasure uh, to announce the, the launch of this series, uh, which is uh, going to be co-edited by Tiago De Luca, who's here too somewhere. Uh, hi, Tiago. I'm so pleased to be able to work with you. I know that we, have, uh, we are on the same wavelength, and uh, we agree on so many aspects, although there might be one or two quarrels uh, along the way. Uh, but... Um, um, the, the thinkers and cinema will focus on past and present philosophers. I'm publicizing about this because I do hope to receive proposals from you and from your colleagues um, in, the for, um, in, in the future. Um, so it's going to focus on past and present philosophers, writers, and other eminent intellectuals who are passionate about cinema and have developed new thought on its basis. Whilst explaining and interpreting thinkers' ideas, the series will give pride of place to the films at their origin as a means to celebrate films' capacity not only to inspire and entertain, but also to change the world. The authors of thinkers and cinema will be specialists internationally recognized as authorities on the thinkers in question, as well as on film studies. Their approach will be aimed at enabling the general public through sophisticated but accessible language, very important, to understand and appreciate the thought derived from great films. Uh, the volumes will have a variable format which may or may not include appendices with interviews and short articles by the thinkers themselves alongside uh, an author's essayistic approach. Thinkers and cinema will be devoted to knowledge as much as to the pleasure of viewing films. Our plan is to devote our first volume to a study of Jacques Rancière and his contribution to thinking cinema. And talking about Rancière, but finally um, I come to our star today, who's one of the world's greatest philosophers, as you all already know. <laughs> 
Don't make faces, please. <laughs> you can imagine how difficult it is for me to do justice to an intellectual figure of his magnitude. Suffice it to say that a quick search resulted in no less than 21 books already written about Concierge, only in the French and English languages, without considering the hundreds of articles on him and using his works. And apart from the nearly 40 books written by Rancière himself, which in turn have been translated into dozens of other languages. This, uh, these astonishing numbers testify not only to his breathtaking product productivity, but also to his generosity in sharing his ideas with audiences of all kinds and backgrounds across the world, as his presence here today well demonstrates. Rancière is not only an immensely insightful and original philosopher, but he has radically changed the landscape of art criticism and, in particular, film criticism. His care for and attention to cinema places him within that wonderful tradition in French philosophy of embracing film as a serious subject and allows us, to, uh, moreover, to find natural continuation and evolution to the thought of the two greatest French thinkers of cinema before him, André Bazin and Gilles Deleuze. Indeed, in his groundbreaking book on cinema, La Fable Cinématographique, translated into English as film fables, Rancière has critically revised the thought of these two great theorists whilst producing his own revolutionary ideas on cinema, which feed into a cinematic fable, as he prefers to call it, rather than a theory of the seventh art. One of Rancière's cornerstone ideas, and particularly relevant to today's event, refers to aesthetics, or aesthesis, the Greek term that he makes use of. This is now enshrined in a thick recent volume where he defends the view that aesthetics, unlike art, is firmly grounded in history, um, uh, with its beginning in the West dating to the end of the 18th century and deriving from specific, a specific mode of sensible experience of art, which started then. Rancière's defense of and devotion to the concept of, of aesthetics has placed him in a collision course with other important thinkers of our time, such as, such as Jean-Marie Schaeffer, Alain Badiou, Pierre Bourdieu, and Jean-François Lyotard. But it also became extremely inspirational to scores of art and film thinkers who, like me, resort to what he defines as the aesthetic regime of art as a tool to locate the political within the art form itself, rather than on representational or discursive devices. Our new Center for Film Aesthetics and Cultures is also tributary to Rancière's thought, insofar as it posits cinema as art, uh, as the art by excellence of the aesthetic age. I'm personally indebted to another of Rancière's uncompromisingly democratic and empowering concepts, that of the emancipated spectator which reinterprets his famous thesis of the ig ignorant master for the arts. Deconstructing the widespread notion of passive spectatorship, Rancière states, being a spectator is not some passive condition that we should transform into activity. Every spectator is already an actor in her, her story. Every actor, ev every man of action is the spectator of the same story. I don't need to stress how liberating such an idea is for us cinephiles who so much enjoy sitting back and immersing ourselves in the wonders of the movies. Finally, I'd like to remark on Rancière's refusal to separate art from entertainment, which allows him to combine commercial directors such as uh, Vincent Minelli and Anthony Mann with radically experimental ones, such as Pedro Costa, Chantal, Akiaman, Bellata, and Jean-Marie Straub. This is indeed the subject of Rancière's more recent forays into cinema, which evolve around the notion of écart, or the intervals of cinema. But I think I've said enough. 
And we should now hear from the master himself who will be addressing the subject of cinema um, and the frontiers of art. With you, Jacques Rancière. So first, <coughs> I must thank <coughs> Professor Hugo Tucker and Professor Lucia Negib and all the members of the CEFAC and all the persons who contributed you know, to organizing this event and to all of you for being, for being here with me tonight. Well, well so, I've, so I've announced cinema and the frontiers of art. Well, I bring up my subject with the help of two filmmakers who dealt in different ways with the topic of the frontiers of art. The first one is Vincente Minelli. One of his most celebrated films, The Bandwagon, stages the conflict between two artists. Tony Hunter, an already forgotten star of old time musical comedies played by, <coughs> by uh, Fred Astor, has been invited by his last devotees to try a comeback in New York under the direction of Jeffrey Cordova, an avant-garde stage director, who heretofore has been more concerned with reviving the classics than staging musical comedies. That's why Tony is skeptical. He thinks it impossible to bridge the gap between two worlds. On the one side, the world of the musical, where the artist only needs a light thread to link his numbers, which are only destined to the entertainment of the audience. On the other side, the world of high culture, with its sophisticated plots dealing with the deep issues of the human condition and its noble sentences, tones, and gestures. But the switched-on director brushes his objections aside. He says he's sick of those artificial barriers between art and entertainment. There is no difference, he says, between the performance of the clown with its falling pants, the dance with its theme of romance, or the story of the chap who kills his father, by which he means Oedipus. If it moves you, if it stimulates you, if it entertains you, it's theater. And to convince his reluctant interlocutor, he starts tap dancing, and he invites the musical artist to join him and sing with him. The world is a stage, the stage is a world of entertainment. Well, although Minelli makes fun of the rhetoric and gesticulation of the avant-garde directors, he knows that the latter's problem is his own, his own problem. The bandwagon is the adaptation of a Broadway musical comedy, and it is a film produced by Metro Goldwyn Mayer, a Hollywood company devoted to entertain the big crowds of the movie theaters. But he also knows that this commercial company has adopted a curious logo, in which the roaring lion of glory is surrounded by three attributes, which include cinema in the great tradition of learned culture. So these three attributes, the laurels of artistic excellence, the mask of the theatrical performance, and a Latin motto which reads, Ars gratia artist, art for art's sake. What is at stake is not only a matter of a brand image for a company. The status of cinema as an art rests on the dismissal of the opposition between art and entertainment. To that extent, it stands exactly at the opposite of the so-called modernist credo, contrasting the autonomy of high art, devoted to the exploration of its own medium, with the forms of popular entertainment, enslaved to the power of culture, industry, and commodity culture. The possibility for cinema to become an art depended on a totally opposite understanding of modernity. The same that is embodied in the film by the stage director Jeffrey Cordova, because it is mostly for the mediation of the avant-garde reformers of the theater than the young art of cinema inherited it. That modernist tradition set out to erase the frontier, separating high art from popular culture, art from non-art, and ultimately art from life. It did not do so out of humanistic generosity toward popular culture, or political commitment to, <coughs> to the people. It did so because art as such, art in the singular, has only existed in our civilization since the abolition of the old hierarchies opposing liberal arts to mechanical arts. In that sense, the motto Ars Gratia Artist is not out of place. One has readily associated the formula art for art's sake with the, the, with the idea of the autonomous and elitist artwork 
created by artists living in the ivory tower, far from the, far from the crowd. But by doing so, one forgets that, for instance, the French inventor of the formula of the poet Théophile Gautier did not find it by looking at the classical plays at the Comédie Française, but by looking at the shows of the popular theatres dedicated to pantomime. One forgets that the poet most strongly associated, you know, in the modernist tradition with the idea of pure poetry, Stéphane Mallarmé, looked for the models of what he called uh, Western aesthetics in the silent performances of small popular theatres, the fun fairs, or musical performances like Lois Fuller's Serpent Serpentine Dance. One also forgets that the artist most celebrated from New York to Paris and Moscow in the 1920s by avant-garde artists, poets, writers, or theorists was neither Kandinsky nor Schoenberg, but Charlie Chaplin. The popular performance provides a model of pure art because it doesn't search to be more than an entertaining performance. In the places devoted to high art, artists always look for something else. They want to unveil the hidden realities of the social world or the unconscious motivations of the individuals, or they want to show their ability to invent new plots or new forms and to produce new unknown emotions for an elite that proves by the same token its own distinction. <clears throat> but instead, all the art of the popular performance is devoted to the performance itself, whose end is not to provide the audience with a sense of their social or intellectual status, but only to provide them with pleasure, pure pleasure, the pleasure produced by the sole success of the performance, which means the perfection of a movement. As Mallarmé puts it about Loy Fuller's dance, the dancer creates an artistic performance, I quote, out of the sole emotion, emotion of her dress. The emotion displayed on the stage is no more the expression of the heartbreaking graves of old-fashioned plots. It is the emotion of a piece of cloth, an emotion reduced to pure movement. Or it is the emotion of a pure apparition that gets out of the night and mingles with the colored lights of the spotlights before disappearing in the dark. This joint performance of movement and light that the poet describes seems to anticipate the specific power that cinema has to the performance. The pleasure provided by Chaplin's films is not only the pleasure of the bodily performance substituted for the plots of broken hearts, it's also the reduction of the bodily performance itself to the design of graphic forms emerging from the night of the theater on the white surface of the screen. Now, this double abstraction that extracts the bodily movement from the story and the graphic design from the bodily movement is itself dependent upon both the technical apparatus of cinema and the material dispositive of popular entertainment. The pleasure pro provided by the pure choreography of graphic forms on a plain surface was first the pleasure of a scientific attraction destined to the audience of popular fairs who got into a dark box when they enjoyed the luminous projections of black shadows on a white screen. Cinema is not an art, though, though it is a form of popular entertainment. It is an art because it's popular entertainment, because it is a social ritual. This is a lesson that the Hollywood filmmaker has learned from the avant-garde tradition itself. The lesson, I think, is still topical today. We know how, for instance, during the last decades, the white cube, once devoted to the demonstration of autonomous art, has been progressively invaded by a multitude of unidentified objects or performances. On the contrary, and in a sense paradoxically, cinema, because it is linked with the time and space of a social form of entertainment, I escaped this process of disidentification. Now, this is only one aspect of the paradoxical relation between cinema and art. Cinema is an art because it is less than art, it is entertainment. But the paradox must be completed by the opposite statement. Cinema is not, <coughs> cinema is, <coughs> is not an, an art because it is more than art, it is a word. Such is the statement supported by one of the filmmakers most strongly associated, however, with the idea of artistic cinema or avant-garde cinema, 
namely Jean-Luc Godard. Among the statements that, that appear now and then as reference in those histories, there is one that says, cinema is neither an art nor a technique, it's a mystery. I understand this sentence. <clears throat> what does mystery mean? Why is cinema a mystery? And why is a mystery, a mystery less or more than art? I propose that we try to answer those questions out of a specific passage in the histories of cinema, in Godard's histories of cinema, the second episode of the second part called Fatal Beauty. In this episode, the word mystery appears in superimposition upon a face that is well known. I hope it appears, yes, it appears. <clears throat> Though, of course, we recognize the face of the young boy in Seurat's, in Sur I think, yes, in, Sur in Seurat, Seurat's Bezos in Anier, the young boy, you know, who, who cups his hands round his mouth, as if he wanted to call somebody on the bank to join him. Well, at first sight, there is nothing mysterious in the ordinary sense of the word about this image except the fact that it quickly dissolves and makes appear an over young and happy face. So the, fa <coughs> the, so the face of the blonde baser painted by Renoir, on which will be later super, superimposed, superimposed a word, the name of an over girl associated with stories of basing, but also stories of disappearance, Proust, Marcel Proust, Albertine. Well, this is the first clue to understand what a mystery is and in what sense cinema is a mystery. A mystery is not an enigma. It's a poetic figure of correspondence between two terms. There is an element, a word, an image, a sound, which calls an other element. For instance, the, beauty, the mute image of the boy, in a sense, is in the place of his, of his voice, but also this, it is here to call another image, the young girl, who in turn will evoke a name in a book, which in turn calls another name or another face. Mr. Ravis first seems to designate a system of echoes or resonances that goes across the forms of identification and linkage proper to the narrative logic and that splits them so as to produce new connections between those fragments. Just before the sentence appears on the screen, Godel's voice has denounced the invention of the script that was the work, he says, of a minor accountant in Hollywood's industry who wanted to put some order in the disorder of Maxenet's gags. Just after, the same Godard will, will cite Bre Robert Bresson's famous sentence about the necessity for the images to be free of any interpretation in order to remain open in all directions and available for getting into new links with other images. The mystery of cinema thus seems to consist in this capacity of the images to free, to free themselves from the narrative role in the plot and create free connections with other images a movement with another movement, a gesture with another gesture, a face with another face, a smile with another smile, but also a smile with a cry, or a mute face with a voice, etc. It is in that sense that cinema gives us more than the performances of an art. It gives us the physiognomy of a historical world. But there is something more about this matter of mystery, and something that I would try to investigate out of a sequence that occurs at the beginning of the same episode in the histories of cinema. At the beginning of this episode devoted to fatal, fatal beauty, Godard stages himself looking at four examples of fatal instants, four gestures of women. For instance, first, a woman painfully crawling on a slope with a gun in her hands. Then, another woman running with her hand up calling somebody that we don't see. Two images of fierce determination where we recognize two characters knowingly running towards their destination, which is death. First, Jennifer Jones as Pearl in King Vidor's Dwell in the Sun, climbing the slope of the mountain where she wants to join a beloved and hated lover for a final fight. Then, 
Anna Magnani as Pina in Rossellini's Roma Cita Aperta, trying to reach the truck that carries her fiancé before being shot dead by the bullets of the German soldiers. Then comes this image of a clumsy, a clumsy overdressed woman with a stupefied, stupefied gaze and hands cluttered. So, his hands are cluttered with all kinds of superfluous objects. An idiot. An idiot who will soon be shot dead and die in the arms of her lover without seemingly understanding what happens. If I focus on those images, it is, of course, because they make, because they make a link with my first example. On these images, we recognize Shirley MacLaine and the fatal instant is taken from Minelli's most famous dramatic film, Some Came Running. Well, and that at this meeting point between my two filmmakers, it is possible to articulate two questions. How can this clumsy body embody both the artistic power that cinema holds from the fact of being mere entertainment and the power of mystery that carries it beyond the limits of art. Well, let us start from the first question, the relationship between art and entertainment. The point is that some came running is a more difficult case than the bandwagon that I evoked, you know, at the beginning of my talk. In the bandwagon, the tap dancer and the avant-garde stage director could agree on the fact that art and entertainment are the same emotion of movement. And the spectators, in turn, could disregard the love story between the tap dancer, Fred Astor, and the classical ballerina, Sid Charis, and give themselves up to the pure emotion of their movements. Well, but, but Jeannie, the awkward girl that appears on Goddard's screen, is neither a classical ballerina nor a musical artist. She is not, not, uh, no artist at all. She is a stupid and big-hearted Trump, who has followed up to a small, small provincial town, the drunk guy who had picked up, uh, up in a bar in Chicago. By the same token, this melodrama character has got into a perfect melodrama. It turns out that the drunk guy, Dave, with whom she has fallen desperately in love, is a down-on-his-luck writer who gets back to his birthplace, a small town deep in Indiana, where it is a matter of shame for his brother, a local notable, who at the same time has an affair with his secretary and trouble with her daughter. Dave shares his time in the town between the back rooms of gambling, gambling dens where he befriends an inveterate, inveterate gambler played by Dean Martin and the Georgian-style villas of the local notables where he vainly courts a young and beautiful professor of literature who, unfortunately, is more interested in his talent as a writer than in his sexual overtures. As she discovers his relationship with Ginny and turns him away, Dave decides on a sudden impulse to marry Ginny, a decision which could lead to a happy end, after all, if Ginny was not herself pursued by her former lover. This seems to make for a desperate situation, not only for Ginny, but also for art itself. How is it possible to extract the pure emotion of movement from the pathos of the melodrama? How is it possible to make Jeannie a pure case of mystery? I would like to suggest that the answer to those twin questions may require that we slightly displace the terms of the problem. To understand this shift, I propose that we look at the sequence from which Godard has extracted his images. Ginny has just married Dave when a former lover appears amidst the excitation of the fun fair, commemorating the birth of the city. I just want to get out of parking. And um, can we go by my place first? I'd kind of like to pick up my pillow and take it with us. Remember the one you bought me? And can we go by Smitty's for just one beer? I'd kind of like to see the girls. They're expecting it. They bought some rice. 
Alabama. What are you doing here? I thought she was the best man. They're coming back to say goodbye. You want some rice? He didn't come in here, did he? Oh, what's his name? Ginny's old friend. That hood from Chicago. He heard she got married and he's out looking for Dave. Oh, he's full of talk. I don't know. He's got a gun and he's crazy drunk. What's he aiming to do? Kill Dave, he says. I tell you, he's crazy. I tried talking to him and he pulled a gun on me. All right, you stay here and I'll try and find Dave. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
what strikes us first in this sequence is the way in which the filmmaker has used the narrative element in the plot, the fun fair, which is supposed to celebrate you know, the birth of the city, Parkman. So he has used this narrative element to superimpose a visual plot on the narrative plot. Not only does the murderer happen, the murder happen amidst the colored lights and the rhythms of the fair, but from the very beginning, the manhunt is treated like a kind of musical performance. The murderer first appears as a silhouette absorbed in a red color, which is at the same time the realistic color of a brick wall and an artificial color, the color of a spotlight, which equates the spot of the realistic drama with the space of a stage. The same happens later with a pink light, which is produced by the neon sign of a bar, yet evokes at the same time the artificial lights of a musical stage. From this point on, the manhunt will exactly look like one of those numbers that Tony Hunter set on, set on the stage of the theater in the bandwagon. And notably, it looks very much like a, you know, a kind of rare detective story that is one of the number of uh, Fred Astor in the bandwagon. The murderer and his follower, Dean Martin, emerge in turn before the big wheel and its multicolored lights as if they came from the wings of the stage. In such a way, it is the visual plot of a choreographic performance that engenders the melodic event of Ginny's death, up to the moment when Dave removes his hand from Ginny's back and looks at its red color, a moment that has also been selected by Godard and evokes his well-known sentence about cinematographic blood stories, it's not blood, it's red. But this doesn't mean, however, that we are not moved by Ginny's fate, but by the sole emotion of movement or the sole perfection of the graphic design of the movement of the bodies. Precisely, the choreographic perfection of the performance only reaches its destination at the point where where it meets the gesture, which also means the mystery, of a body that resists any choreography whatsoever. A, a, a body that, that cannot join in the dance and has to remain out of step or of the beat, definitely. Such is Jenny's body. She falls, died, in the same clumsy way as she has lived, before, before our eyes since the beginning of the film, when we have first seen her emerging from the bus with a round face, clum clumsily made up, her round eyes and her dazed look, bearing, bearing in her hands a bag in the form of a fluffy rabbit, to which she has added in the meantime the embroidered pillow bearing the word sweetheart. The body of an idiot then, but precisely, a body that makes what the word idiot normally call, what we word, what we normally call idiocy, slip from being the feller of one who doesn't understand towards another idiocy. The idiocy of an art that blurs the reference points that serve ordinarily in understanding and in making understand. This idiocy unsettles the normal logic of the melodramatic plot. The Typical melodramatic situation usually contrasts nature with social conventions. For instance, it pits the naive impulse of sincere feelings or brute desires against the rules and conventions governing the relationships between individuals, classes, and sexes. But the idiotic body exceeds the vast nature versus society plot from both sides. On the one hand, she is, Ginny is more than natural. She is mere nature. She reacts in a physical way to physical stimuli, regardless of any social code. On the other hand, she is a totally artificially artificial being, a body entirely fashioned by her flashy pink makeup, her loud lipstick, her glass jewelry, her rabbit-like bag, and her embroidered pillow. The idiotic body then disrupts the very opposition between the stupidity of a sentimental story and the formal refinement of a mise en scène. Such might be the mystery included in Ginny's clumsy attitude in front of the killer. She is the power that disrupts the plot from the inside. It's not, it's not a question of merely opposing the visual perfection of the plot 
of the shot to the heaviness of the plot of love and death, and to praise the filmmaker for having turned a pulp fiction character into a white form on a multicolor background. In a much more radical way, the character escapes the heaviness of the plot to the extent that she also escapes the power of the artist, the power of the refined metre en scène who turns every stupid plot into a formal choreography of gestures and colours. The mystery of a gesture or the idiocy of a body is its metamorphic power. At the meeting point of two genres, musical comedy and melodrama, a third element emerges, a body that belongs to art to the extent that it doesn't belong to art at all. A body whose singular performance makes us shift, not simply, not simply from, from popular entertainment to art, but from a regime of sense experience to another regime of sense experience, from a regime in which popular entertainment and high art are opposites to a regime in which they can no more be distinguished from each other. Cinema challenges the frontiers of art because it creates these singular bodies that alter the normal distribution of capacities and incapacity attributed to bodies according to their conditions, their place, and their function. This is what Mallarmé looked for in the fun fairs or at the Folie Bergère. This is what was embodied in the clumsy gait and the virtuoso tricks of Chaplin's Trump. But this is also what Seurat looked for when he associated the formal principles of a new art of painting with the lights of a parade on the Paris Boulevard, the color dots transcribing the indolence of Sunday entertainment at La Grande Jatte, or the confident call of the young boy with the red cap on which Godard superimposed the word a mystery. The mystery of the forms escaping the identified characters of identified plots exceeds art from both sides. Toward popular entertainment, which is less than art, and toward the social redistribution of capacities of the body, which is more than art, since it draws the figures of a new sensible world. The young bather in the water of the Seine, the serpentine dancer on the stage of the Folie Bergère, the clumsy tramp means the lights of the provincial funfair, draws a figure of a modernity in which any plebeian body can be the subject of art, because any plebeian body can enjoy, along with the time of leisure, the delights of light and color, or the despairs of impossible love stories. Needless to say, such a modernism stands at exactly the opposite of the so-called avant-gardism proclaimed by Clement Greenberg when he opposed avant-garde to kitsch culture and pointed out the big disaster that threatened the dignity of high art, those peasants' daughters who had discovered, along with the schedule of the factory and, and the forms of urban, urban existence, an unknown time of leisure and, he says, a new capacity for boredom that made them put a pressure on society, asking it to create a culture fit for them. But this cinematographic invention of metamorphic bodies should not be viewed only in one sense, as the invention which allowed to welcome in the realm of art the performances of the clowns or the, sorrow, or the sorrows of poor idiot girls. It is still at work today. <clears throat> I would assume, in forms of cinema that are indeed acknowledge, acknowledged as art and even avant-garde art, but are for these very reasons excluded from the realm of the luminous shadows of the entertaining black box and pushed towards the white cubes of contemporary art museums. I would like to illustrate this point by looking at a sequence borrowed from a film that seems to stand at the exact opposite of the enchantments of Minelli's choreography, namely Pedro Costa's Colossal Youth. As you may know, Colossal Youth is the third film of a trilogy devoted by the Portuguese filmmaker to a small group of immigrants and drug addicts in the suburbs of Lisbon. The first film, Ossos, still had provided the spectator with something looking like a plot, but the second and the third are deprived of any fictional plot, at least apparently. The second film, In Vanda's Room, 
clearly took on the form of an inquiry about the life of those persons in a real setting at a precise moment during the destruction of the shanty town where they lived. As colossal youth follows some of them, and notably the Cap Verdean Mason Ventura in the white buildings where they are rehoused, it presents itself at first sight as a chronicle of their life. To that extent, it seems to belong to a genre of cinema situated on the margins of art, namely documentary. But it soon, it soon appears that it belongs much more to those chronicles of the everyday which exceed the normal framework of documentary inquiry. Documenting the life of a specific social group in a specific historical concept, this normally, normally, means providing necessary and sufficient information to make us perceive at the same time the reality of their situation and the sense that must be made of it. A documentary about poor immigrants and underdogs must make us recognize the signs of poorness or destitution and connect those signs with an overview and a general interpretation of the social relationships. But we know that many so-called documentary filmmakers do something quite different. They precisely use the documentary form, meaning the absence of fictional plot, to disrupt this normal or consensual relation between sense and sense, between the visible and its meaning. They spend too much time with their characters, a time which doesn't tell us more about their condition and the reasons why they undergo it, but on the contrary, endows their bodies with a power of disturbance that makes us lose the sense of the normal connections between a situation, its causes, the way it is lived, and the consequences that can be drawn of all that. In such a way, those real individuals seized in their real environment become metamorphic bodies in turn, metamorphic bodies that make us unsure as to what is in front of our eyes and what sense we can make of it. This is exemplary the case with colossal use, and notably that with the sequence that I would like us to see now, a sequence featuring two characters, Ventura, so the Cap Verdean Mason, whose black silhouette cat-like gaze and ceremonious way of speaking have given the tone of the film and is Paul Lento, who, on the contrary, all along the film has presented the face of the coarse, illiterate worker, notably unable to learn the love letter that Ventura time, time, time and again tries to teach him. In the sequence that we, have, that we will see now, however, it seems he seems to become himself a metamorphic body or a figure of mystery. And this is what I would like to see if we can see. Esta flor, mon mari je n'ai la bâche. Esta flor, mon mari je n'ai la bâche. Mon quatre filles, mon mouillère, et en cima de carreau, tout le picadinho, picadinho. Esta flor, mon grito. Un grito, t'en quoi pour les masses. Tu m'as mis en paix, bombeiros, Santa Barbara Générosa. T'en grito, bobo. Fica tudo escuro. Bota em minha mão. O que mais? Fica colado na parede, mil graus. Que estava ali de temperatura. Canto com uma notícia de ontem hora. Que hora me? De ontem hora, tchau, pavô. Vou até o aeroporto. Era o que te chorava. E merda que não tinha esse bom morrer. Merda que não tinha esse morrer na marinha no campo grande afogado. 
Il m'a dit que nous avons 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 dit que nous depois no Porto de Janeiro. Mas, nem a polícia, nem o copicão, nem o cigano, nem o branco, isso que eu consigo que eu não vou Faz que chega no colchão. Para morte. Para morte é dificuldade que não atravessa. E agora? Agora? O que é que eu estou fazendo? Faz. Não está vivo ali, está sem a vizinha. Não está mesmo ali em frente, não me sai o primeiro direito. Já não esteve mais perto. Bem vivo comigo em teu quarto. E os filhos? É isso que me entrou aí na janela. É o cotil que me entrou aí na janela. Qual o brinco ali? Não está ninguém na janela. Vou conseguir tudo, governador. Água, eletricidade, gás, bem. Vou trabalhar dia e noite. Está dormindo sozinho, Neto? Eu gostava de te oferecer 100 mil cigarros, uma dúzia de vestidos daqueles mais modernos, um automóvel, casinha de lava que tanto querias e um ramalhete de flor de quatro sustões. Mas a gente estuda coisa. Bebo uma garrafa de um vinho bom e pensei em mim. Esse quarto ali de meu colher caixa. Foi ali que começa. Tem lá o neto. Tem lá o governador. In some came running, if you remember, there was a kind of whole metamorphosis in the texture of the film, starting with the red color of a wall. I think the same happens here with a brown and almost invisible color that invades the screen when Ventura knocks at the door. This brain color, too, is both a narrative element, the trace of a fire, and a pure sensory event, which makes us get into a new space. And in fact, as soon as the door is shut, the devastated room is turned into something like a theatrical stage. Lento and Ventura stand immobile, hand in hand, in front of us, and the dialogue takes on the rhythm of a tragic psalmody with its alternating voices. Later on, the stupid Lento will proudly recite the love letter he had, he had always been unable to memorize. And in the meantime, he will tell us with a ceremonious tone how he lost a wife and children 
while they all jumped through the window to escape the fire in the apartment, the fire that he had himself kindled out of despair. Okay, but the problem is that the Lento that we, are, that we knew in the film had no wife and he had no children. Uh, still more puzzling is the fact that we have already seen him dead, followed from a pole as he was trying to connect their shack to the electric network when he was still a bachelor living with Ventura. So it might be said that from this point on, we understand what was still unclear to us during all the film. The episodes of the film are not lived scenes, you know, documenting the existence of the Cap Verdean immigrants. They are constructed fictions, not fictions in the sense of stories of fictional characters played by actors, but forms of condensation of their own destiny and of the destiny of those who share their condition. And for instance, that family who actually died in the conditions that are told here during the shooting of the film. But the point is not about what we understand, it's about what we see. The lento that we see and hear now is something like a living dead, an inhabitant of the inferno coming back into our world. His opaque body has become the surface on which is life, the life of Ventura, and of all those who share their condition can appear such as it is. A life on the verge of life and death, a life of living dead. By trespassing the frontiers, separating documentary reality from fiction, the filmmaker also disturbs the normal way of representing social inequality. On the one hand, the poor immigrants are more than poor immigrants. They are artists able to turn their own destiny into a play that they perform themselves. On the other hand, they are less than poor immigrants. They are living dead coming from the inferno. But this metamorphic power of their bodies also produces the equivalence of two spaces the inferno of the living dead of capitalist exploitation and the realm of shadows of art. The dark silhouettes of Ventura and Lento are at the same time bodies of real individuals playing their own story and weird silhouettes evoking the films of a colleague of Vincent Minnelli, a Hollywood filmmaker who specialized in the 30s, in low-budget horror films about living dead, zombies, cat people, or leopard men, destined to a popular audience, namely Jacques Tourneur, who is in fact one of the masters recognized by Pedro Costa. Such might be the paradoxical point about the relation between cinema, art, and entertainment. On the one hand, cinema and the tradi tradition of cinephilia have blurred the borders of art. They had made it possible that an avant-garde filmmaker give to the bodies of immigrant workers reenacting or rather reinventing their own life a metamorphic power borrowed from the artifice of commercial cinema. They have made it possible for him to use this metamorphic power to disrupt along with the usual modes of representation of social misery or destitution the very separation between fiction and documentary, which is itself a separation between two kinds of human beings. But it transpires as though the frontier that has been crossed in one direction could no more be crossed again in the opposite direction. A form of art that turns Hollywood zombies into Cape Verdean immigrants apparently can no more find its place in the world of entertainment, in this world, a film about living dead and a film about the condition of immigrant workers belong to separate genres, destined to separate audiences, which also means that they require different ways of treating the bodies, their gestures, and their ways of occupying space. The separation between art and entertainment, then, takes on a new form. Any form of commercial entertainment can be given the dignity of art, but not any form of art can be recognized as a form of entertainment fit for the, the audience of movie theaters. There is one form of entertainment that apparently can only be art. This form of entertainment which produces 
unformatted films, unformatted connections of images, words, and sounds. As a result, such films are sent on the other side of the frontier, towards the places which are now destined to the specific enjoyment of unidentified objects and performances, namely contemporary art centers and art museums. What disappears with this formatting of the forms of entertainment is the very power of the metamorphic bodies. This power, we know that it worked through a specific mediation, the mediation of the spectator's gaze. Cinema is an art which, more than any other perhaps, was invented by its spectators. And in the history of cinema, the images that we have seen earlier, the image of Godard with his tennis cap and his cigar, looking at the flickering images of the histories of cinema. This image reminds us of the role played by a specific form of spectatorship that form knows, uh, known as cinephilia. Cinephilia contributed to making cinema an art by blurring the very criteria of artistic legitimacy. It allowed films which, from the point of view of that legitimacy, were mere commercial products to get into the art of cinema and, and, to, give, and to give to this art its proper texture. Today, perhaps, the role of cinephilia must be, think, must be thought of in the reverse way. The problem is no more to rescue commercial films from the hell of entertainment. It is to rescue unformatted films from the segregated paradise of art. Thank you for your patience. and thought-provoking uh, talk to us today. Uh, we are open for questions. We have some 20 minutes for questions. So um, <coughs> obviously, I have my own, but um, <laughs> I would expect you to volunteer first. Any questions? Are you still digesting? Yes, there is one question here. OK. Um, uh, yes, speak to the mic. <coughs> Thanks. Um, when you talk about metamorphosis, mystery, and sort of this idea of synthesis at the heart of cinema, I was wondering how that relates back to when you say, for example, Schelling um, creates the idea of cinema and how this idea of romantic imagination, synthesis, metamorphosis links back into the cinematic image. Um, it's not so much a question, but... <laughs> um, well, in what ways do those romantic imagination and the idea of synthesis um, develop within cinema? You know? And if you could just say a bit more about Schelling and his uh, role in creating the idea of cinema. Fr Fr Friedrich Schelling. Yeah. I was trying to find about uh, to, 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 to find you know a, a series of film of film you know named Schelling. <laughs> it, was a, it was a problem. No, no, no. Well, uh, okay, okay. Oh, I don't uh, I don't think that there is a direct uh, a direct a direct uh, direct connection. But, well, the connection is you know well the idea of shif of shifting you know of, uh, the, the idea of shifting the, uh, the uh, so from one sensible word to another sensible word. And of course this has been uh, this has been expressed you know so in philosophy terms in philosophical terms by no, notably not notably by Schelling and it's part of the well yeah, yes romantic romantic imagination so to well to getting getting you know getting from a certain status you know of sense experience to something which is so something like a kind of invisible word of sense you know in, in a way you know and of course it's uh, of course we, we it's uh, the formal the, the formal structure may be may, may be the same but what what, what is uh, what is at stake here you know is not well it's not so much some kind of metaphysical distinction between uh, let us see an an outward and inward word of sense well, what is at stake in fact well is a rather uh, uh, well, a difference between uh, 
two, two regimes of experience, which are at the same time, let us say, well, to also two social, two social forms of experience, because what, what, inter what interests me, you know, as well, the, what, what is related to, to the capacity, to the capacities or the capacity of the body. So, to the, so, so the question, so the issue, you know, of the issue of getting of getting from one word to another word you know well i try to well, well i try to set to set it uh, to set it uh, here you know well in other in other terms you know so uh, well getting from a, a certain form of sensory exp of, of regime of experience when there is on the one on the one hand you know i art i art uh, you know formal refinement etc etc and the other hand you know just popular popular entertainment and stupid uh, and and stupid bodies you know and getting so shifting from this from this word from this hierarchical word in fact of you know of, sen of sensory experience well to let us see kind of an egalitarian word you know of sensory of sensory experience so so the, for me what, what into Interesting here, you know. So, well, the way in which the way in which you know really the the body of the idiot of the absolute level of, of the absolute idiot, which also is a kind of, of the body, you know, of kind of a kind of idiotic genre, you know, of well, uh, of melodrama, you know, the Trump, you know, with the big heart, you know, it was it was a kind of caricature, you know, it has been a caricature, you know, from many 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 time much time, you know. And so, uh, so, what interests me is well, the way in which you know, uh, well, well, this. This kind of body, this kind of body, you know, is really, is, is really, well, ripped, you know, from the normal sphere of experience, which apparently is, is her sphere of experience, you know, and, and, and really, really put, uh, put into an over, an over sphere of experience, which means precisely what, well, there is this kind of sensory texture of the film where, it becomes uh, it becomes impossible to say you know first to say well, well is this uh, is this is this melodrama is this melodrama is this some kind of uh, uh, some kind of number of, of of a musical stage you know which means all which means at a certain point uh, we can uh, we can uh, you can no more say uh, this is uh, this is art this is art this is well, well this is this is entertainment you know so well this is the way in which I try to think the. The, to, to think the power of the metamorphic body, but but it's true, but it's true that it rests on a certain idea, a certain idea of practice of art, you know, so of, uh, of you know, uh, you know, shifting, you know, of shifting, you know, of shifting, you know, where really is the very position, the very position of the bodies and, and the word and the words, you know, the word in which they, they, they inhabit. One question about. Uh, the uh, idiotic body of mm. the spectator. Mm. Um, mm him or herself uh. um, and the, the, the body of the so-called passive spectator that uh. you so much contest mm -hmm. uh, because you, mm. you write that there is an activity which mm. is specific mm. to mm. the spectator. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder how those bodies relate. The spectator body seen as uh, possibly an idiotic spectator that takes in anything even entertainment in its pure form, and the idiotic body on the screen. Well, I think there are, there are, for me there are two points. You know, well, well, if we look at uh, what happened, well, of course there is a position of the spectator in front of the film. You know, but there is also I, uh, I, I would say you know, in the film it's the film itself. You know, I, I mean I'm thinking of, of some came running. You know, in a way, well, in a way, you know, overturns, or overturns the situation, you know, or the overturns, you know, the relation of the spectator, of the spectator and the, and, and the actor, you know, because what is striking, what is striking in, in this in, in this sequence, you know, is the way in which, you know, well, the let us say. Well, the, the, the clever guys, you know, be, become spectators, you know, and notably Sinatra, you know, and 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 notably and, and Sinatra. Well, he becomes a well, he becomes he becomes a spectator, a spectators of her active. So 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 it is she, you know, it is her, you know, the the idiot, the, 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 the idiot, you know, the idiot, you know, which is we suppose we suppose precisely to be. Well, somebody passively, you know, looking, uh, you, you know, looking things, you know, happen, you know, and but, but no, uh, now it is her, it is her gesture, you know, it is her trajectory, you know, that become that becomes activity in a way, you know, and 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 they are uh, they are unable, they are unable in a way, you know, to to, to deal to deal with it, you know, and I think they. they um, 
and even you know in this uh, in this last moment you know with uh, with Sinatra you know looking uh, at at his uh, at his end you know with with, with, with the red with, with the red uh, the, the, <coughs> patch, you know, uh, of blood. Uh, well, there is something, uh, there is some, some, precise, some kind of, uh, of transfer, you know, of transfer of idiocy in, in the sense of not understanding. He is the one who doesn't understand, you know, and, you know, at the end, uh, at the end, at the end of the day. So I think, so I think there is, uh, there is also in the film itself uh, some kind of, uh, of, or we can find in the film itself some kind of fable, you know, about uh, spectatorship or about activity and activity and passivity, you know. Of course. I say we can find. We can find precisely we meaning the, also the activity of the spectator, which means for me also that, uh, well, a spectator, in a way, a uh, spectator, uh, well, uh, looks, uh, is, is somebody who looks, uh, who looks at a film, you know, from, from different angles, you know, and also at different, at different moments, you know. So, so uh, I think, I think that really to, to well, to, to take to take on you know the the role uh, let, let us say of the of the learned spectator you know who can comment you must first you know take on you know really the attitude of the of the so called you know idiot spectator you know so we have so you 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 have first well just to look to look well it's well, it's a, it's a melodrama, and of course, it, well, it's beautiful, the colors are beautiful, the movement is beautiful, I think, at the same time, I think. I don't think, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know, you know, any, any filmmaker, you know, able you know, to construct, you know, those, those movements of crowns, you know, in this way, I think. It's, 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 it's incredible, it's incredible. So, but, uh, so uh, I would say that there is the first time, you know, you are in front of this, well, this stupid story, and at the same time, you know, well, uh, you know, fascinated, fascinated with this play of light color and movement, you know. Well, in the second moment, we think that perhaps, you know, it's not a matter of, of saying, well, the, the, story is, the story is stupid, but he is a very clever guy. No, you know, very, very, well, I think the, 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 the matter of idiocy precisely, you know, means that you, that you, you disrupt, you know, this, this setting of the issue. You know. I was struck by what you said towards the end of your talk about how it seems that cinema shows us that any entertainment can become art, mm. but it's more difficult for any art to become entertainment, um, if I haven't misunderstood that altogether. Um, so my question is, is this something that's peculiar to Pedro Costa's films, or is this something that we should look, uh, if I'm not presuming too much there, or is this something that we can find in art cinema in general, do we think? Well, of course, Pedro Costa is a kind of uh, extreme, uh, extreme case, you know. Well, because uh, well, he makes he makes his films uh, well w w with the characters themselves. So you can you can say that he is a filmmaker, well, really working on the spot, and and uh, and, the, and the scenes, you know, in colossal use, you know, are precisely you know prepared and constructed with those people themselves. So. Uh, in a way, and, and, and in a way, he told, he tells, he tells the stories of those people, and he constructs, you know, those those stories with with them. But after what happens, of course, uh, the film is presented, you know, so in, in the neighborhood, that's fine. And after, of course, uh, well, the film, uh, the, the film, you know, appears as some kind of uh, well, aesthetic, aesthetic, avant-garde film. You know, it's it's very long. It's two hours. It, it's more than two uh, two hours. You know, and it, it doesn't take uh, much time to understand that those people are poor and that they have a very sad story, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, of course, so of course, it is a kind of extreme case. You know, of well, uh, well, uh, after all, you know, he is one of the filmmakers most uh, most. Uh, Deeply, you know, really committed to, to, to the spot in, and, and with with real people, you know, in in, a so, in this social situation. And but at the same time, of course, while well, he is supposed to be, you know, an art uh, an art filmmaker, you know, and when and, and, and so he, he, he cannot get money, for instance, you know, for having this uh, he, for having it, uh, you know, his films, you, you know, shown, you know, shown in movie theaters because uh, uh, because people say that's so people who decide say, but it, it's a it, it's a festival film. 
film. You know, it's an art film. So a festival film, you don't need to, to you don't need to show it in movie theaters because it's it's for festivals. It's art. You know. So I think it's an extreme case. You know, but but also I think it's a, it's a more it's a more it's a more general trend. I think that we have some kind of of formatting of formatting now. You know, of well, of of the genres of art, which and well and from you know the, the let us say from the blog bus from the blockbuster to, to, to all forms you know, of art, art cinema, you know, with, uh, with, with this limit, you know, that, that, some, uh, that, that some films, you know, apparently, you know, no more, no more fit, you know, the, the framework, the framework of cinema, meaning the framework of something that is presented, that is presented, you know, in, in a movie theater that, and that people have, uh, have to look at during uh, two hours or three hours, and of course, it's a matter of time. And, well, the, the, the result is that more and more, you know, film, uh, filmmakers are, well, more or less, you know, pushed, you know, into the, in the, in the direction of of the art centers, of the museum, and they are, they are, they are asked, you know, for instance, uh, well, to, to try to make, uh, to make some, some, some video, some video work uh, out, of the, out, of, uh, out of their films, and, uh, and uh, well, um, and uh, Pedro Costa did, you know, so, so one or two, you know, uh, video installations, you know, out of, out of, out of this film, but, but really, you know, he, didn't, he, was not, he, he was not really happy with, 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 with this. But I think, yes, yes, it's a trend, it's a trend today, you know, and, well, and it, it's very hard, it is, and I think it's very hard, of course, to, uh, to say exactly where, where, where the limit, where the limit is. But, but obviously, I think this, uh, this exists today, the idea of that all what is not format, formatted, you know, formatted in terms of genre, formatted in terms of time and experience of times, well, is more or less, you know, sent, uh, sent towards contemporary art, you know, and, and, and more, and of course with the place of video installation, etc., etc., in contemporary art mu museum, well, there is, there is this kind of this trend, you know, this trend, I think it's important, and well, this is why I, I suggested that perhaps, you know, the, the role of cinephilia were today, you know, was, a, a, in a sense, exactly the contrary of uh, what it was, you know, so, well, for, let us say 40, 40 years ago. Thank you. You, you mentioned Jean-Luc Godard and, yeah. and the, um, the myth of the passive observer. Mm. To what extent do you think meaning in film can translate into political and social action or transformation even? Well, I, well, I, I think uh, for me, you know, for, for me there are, there, are, there, are different, uh, there are different things, you know. Well, let us say there is a, there is a politics, you know, that is, that, that is well, Involved, you know, involved in making, in making, in making a film, you know. This is one, this is one, this is one thing. At the same time, what there is, there, there, there is no, there is no direct relation. So it, it, it is perfectly clear. First, that, for instance, Pedro Costa, you know, the, well, uh, had, had no influence, you know, about uh, about social policies in Portugal, you know, and well, <laughs> no, 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 Godard, you know, in France or in Switzerland. Well, so I think, uh, well, there, there, there is a very is a kind of politics that is uh, that is involved, you know, in the in the in the making of art, which also means, well, for instance, in the case of Pedro Costa, you know, uh, well, making uh, making uh, making his making his films, uh, well, with the people with the people themselves, you know, for instance, you know, and also, of course, uh, uh, it, it 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 also you know involves you know the well the choice of the, the choice of the equipment, you know, so for instance, Pedro Costa, you know. So he so he shot with a, with a very light you know so a DV camera you know and only natural light you know this mm -hmm. is why it's all it is always very dark you know mm -hmm. uh, be, because it's only the natural light so so there is a choice for instance for instance you know uh, well of uh, of you know you uh, of uh, being uh, no, not too expensive films are always expensive you know yeah. but uh, of being not uh, of Try, trying not to uh, not to be dependent, you know, dependent on the industry, or to be dependent, and well, to um, and and so to to keep uh, to, to keep the, the free the free choice, you know. So this is this is. A pol and in a way, this is a political attitude, you know. But of course, this political attitude, well, has no has no direct, uh, well, political uh, political consequences, you know. Well, uh, so the fact, uh, well. well it, I would say that you know the politics of films, the politics of of filmmakers, you know, well, is is rather some kind, you know, of of participation in a 
wide, uh, in a wider uh, transformations of our forms of uh, forms of of, sensi of sensibility. You know, I don't know really of of film of film that had that had you know uh, real inf that had a real influence. You know, and even propaganda films, uh, propaganda films. You know, it is well known that they convince people who are only con who are already convinced. You know, well, so well, there are various uh, and to, uh, and to, and and today, but and so and so I think that today, in a way, well, uh, the politics, the politics of film, the politics of art is something that is played, that is played mostly inside art itself, which does not mean art for art's sake, you know, but this means, you know, it's about the, the, cho the choice, the choice of the means, you know, the choice of what, what, uh, what you will show, with whom you will work, with what kind of, with what kind of material, in what kind of framework, you know, well, I think well, this is, uh, this is, uh, well, this is, uh, what we can say about the politics, uh, the politics of film today, and of course you can judge, you can judge the films uh, about their political meaning, political signification. But, well, in the end, it's not, it's not very, not very interesting, not very interesting. But I think it's interesting the way in which you know a film, a, a film or a way of doing films, you know, can change something, you know, in our in our behaviors, in our look, you know, in our forms of perception. And, and it's, it's not something very spectacular. Okay, thank you. <coughs> um, the two clips we watched were relatively recent. Um, do you think the sensory potential of film increases as cinema technology progresses, or can um, a, a film that's silent in black and white uh, have as much sensory texture as a color film with sound? Well, I think. Uh, well, I think the, the problem. I think the, 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 the problem is. Uh, well, um, I, think the, I think the potential of a film or the potential of, of a film is also is also well uh, dependent on well the kind of distance of the kind of distance of the kind of distance the kind of break you know that it can operate that it can operate with uh, let us say uh, general uh, uh, gen general forms of presentation you know and it's clear that. For us, for, in, for us, for us, for instance, in a way, you know, of course, uh, well, uh, a black and white film, you know, of the of, of the twenties or of, of the of, of the thirties, you know, can have a more a more strong, you know, a potential precisely because it is out of the normal framework, you know, of of visibility, you know, that is at work, that that, that is, you know, going today. So, uh, well, if we think, for instance, in the uh, I, I think that, that, that there, are, there are two different things, you know, there, there is a role, there is a role of technique, there is a role of technique, but uh, perhaps, you know, the technical, the technical transformations, you know, are, are not as important, you know, as well, uh, let, let, uh, the forms, the forms of presentations of film itself, uh, meaning from the, the ways, the, the, well, the, the places, the places, you know, where films, are, uh, films, you know, are looked at, you know, uh, for for instance. Uh, so, in a way, I, uh, I would say that well, this kind of uh, the increasing formatting, you know, of the films, you know, for separate audience, in a way, something more important than the than the transformations, you know, uh, linked to the dig to, to digital to digital. Technology, you know, but in an over, in, in, on, 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 on the other hand, the digital technology, you know, allows, for instance, people like Pedro Costa to, to make films, you know, be, to make to make cheaper films. But uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that really, uh, uh, for, for me, for me, the, the, the main question, you know, uh, today is not so much about the, the forms of production of the images as it is, you know, about the forms of distributions of the image, the way in which we look, uh, we, we, we look at them, and also, of course, uh, well, there is also the problem of the experience of the experience in, of the movie theater. Well, now, now, uh, more, you know, more and more, you know, we see films, uh, we see films, you know, on a, on our laptop, you know, for instance, you know, and of course, the experience of seeing a film on a laptop, you know, you know, in a, in his or her own room, you know, is not the same, you know, as seeing a film in a movie in a movie theater, you know, on a, on a big screen with other with other people that you that we don't know, etc. So, so in a way, in a way, for instance. 
sense, you know, or a film, a film has, has shifted, you know, precisely from a certain uh, status, you know, of spectatorship to another status of, of, of spectatorship, you know. And I would say that, uh, well, precisely cinephilia, cinephilia was contemporaneous, you know, with the time of the movie theaters, you know. Uh, while, for instance, I think that film studies, film studies is contemporaneous, you know, with, with, with the time precisely of all those techniques that allow us to, well, to look at films, you know, uh, on our la laptop. <laughs> I'm really interested in your work in documentary in particular, and I know that you say that Costa is a limit case, but I wondered if um, you saw documentary as having a kind of singular potential to question frameworks because it's, as you said, on the margins of art. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for being short. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, uh, well, I think. Uh, well, uh, of course, it's. Uh, well, there has, been, there has been this kind of. Uh, well, this kind of perhaps of reverse, or you know, but during perhaps. Well, of course, the documentary has a very long story, but I think uh, that you know, during the last decades, uh, well, pre there was this kind of, of, of shift, you know, or, or overturn overturning, you know, when precisely document documentary, you know, tends to be. Uh, uh, to be, in a sense, more artistic, you know, than fictional film, precisely because uh, in documentary, is, um, in documentary way, so the, the reality is supposed to be given, as it is supposed to be given, you, you, you have not, you know, you have not, uh, uh, you have not to, to, Im to, to, to imagine it, well, in a way, or, or to imagine it rather, you know, in the, well, or to, to create some, to, in the sense of creating some kind of likely, you know, plot, etc., etc. So uh, as, uh, as the reality, in a way, is given, uh, the problem we really is how we how we construct how we construct this this re, this reality, you know, which at the same time is in front of us. So I think well, there is in the, in the documentary, you know, uh, precisely because of on the one hand, you know, the character, you know, of the of the reality as given, and on the other hand, the the character of the of the reality as entirely questionable, you know, which precisely uh, allows for multiplicity. Uh, well, of, uh, of plays, or of plays, and which also means, you know, a multiplicity of plays blurring the very border between uh, be between document between documentary and uh, and fiction. And so, this is why. So we have uh, we have now now many documentary fiction. Documentary fictions meaning uh, how how are we to look at this at this situation? How how are we to look at this uh, at, at this event? You know, I, well, uh, I think not only you know. Uh, uh, to, a f to, a, to a film, you know, what I often cite, but I think it's, it's quite, uh, quite interesting from this point of view, which is a film uh, made by um, the Lebanese filmmakers uh, Khalil Jorej and Joanna Adji Thomas, you know. The film is called, uh, so in France, it's, it, I want to see, so it's Je veux voir in French, Je veux voir, you know, so it's about, uh, so in a way, it's about, li it's all about, huh? With Catherine Deneuve and Rabim Hoé. And what was interesting, you know, is that uh, this, is a, so this is a film, uh, it's also, uh, if we tell, if we speak in terms of plot, you know, <laughs> we can say that the plot is a visit, is a visit, you know, to the, to South Lebanon, to South Lebanon. So with uh, so a Lebanese, a Lebanese performer, Javier Moe, you know, so so going with Catherine Deneuve, a French actress, you know, to see South Lebanon, and so and, and, and she says, I want to see. And and, and what is interesting is that uh, while the film becomes a documentary, you know on the diverse ways into, in which precisely two kinds of actors, you know, can get, in, get, can get into a place, you know, where what is fascinating in, the, in, this, in this travel, you know, is, well, the reaction of two bodies, of uh, two bodies, you know, of actors, an actor, which is an actor, so Rabir Moe, with a Lebanese performer, so Lebanese per performance, which means that, well, from, uh, from many years now, he has been used, you know, to, well, uh, to turn to turn into some kind of comedy, you know what happens. Uh, what happens in Lebanon, and of course, with the with the stars, the stars, you know, the the, you know, the great actress, you know, arriving arriving from from France, you know, uh, in a kind of sacrificial way, you know, to to look at what happens, what happens in South Lebanon, you know. And well, for, well, it's a, it, it's an example, but I think it's a it's a striking uh, example, you know, the way the, the, the way the way in which we, there there is in documentary or. In documentary fiction, you know, the, the, the possibility of a multiplicity of fiction, but 
but are not fictions, you know, in the in the usual uh, in the usual uh, uh, sense uh, sense of the terms, but uh, are perhaps you know for 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 all of this you know more efficient you know than uh, normal fiction. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, I was just wondering the point you made about the difference between the uh, white cube and the black box, and um, with the concept of like digital and post media in the arts nowadays, and whether or not you see, um, because of digital and post media, that distinction between those two bits collapsing? And if so, sort of post that collapse, do you see that something new coming out of that, or do you see a return to sort of more traditional, um, specific cinematic or art orthodoxies? I think it's quite difficult, you know, really, you know, to, well, uh, to see what, uh, what, what is exactly, what is exactly happening, you know. Well, one, sh one thing, one thing is, what well, I think is true, you know. Well, there was a time when, well, well, the museum, the museum was supposed, you know, to be the place for the autonomy of art, etc., high art, etc., and cinema was supposed to be a place for entertainment. Well, of course, uh, well, uh, progressively, progressively, so cinema, cinema could uh, enjoy this kind of ambiguous status, you know, of being entertainment for those who, who look for entertainment and being art for those who look for, who look for, for art, you know. Uh, well, and what, what, what happened, well, I think what, 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 what has happened, we know on, on, the one, on the one end, you know, is what, with, of course, uh, uh, the transformations of the of the practices of of art, you know, of of plastic of, of plastic art. It's, this means that uh, now you know muse uh, museums and museums are not so much you know the places for so-called high or autonomous art, but for all all kinds of unidentified objects, unidentified uh, per performances. You know, well, so, uh, so and you know uh, and. In a way, you know, cinema as cinema, well, let us say that the heart of cinema you know, still is the, the movie theater. You know, as, as we told earlier, of course, cinema tends to also to, to, come, back, to come back home in a way, you know, in our, in our home. But, well, but, uh, so, so I think that there, 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 is, there, there is now this, situ this situation, you know, when on the one hand, on the one hand, you know, there, there, are, there are places, you know, Dedicated to things that are more or less un unidentified, you know, and 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 precise and precisely destined to kinds of spectators who don't know who don't know what they are what what, what they are about to see, you know. except of course if they know the artist, you know, <laughs> and, and know that, that they will, they will do the same kind of things that they have done the last, you know, at, the, at the last Biennale, of course. But well, that's uh, another more, more most interesting point. Well, so uh, and on the other end, the, uh, the other end, there is this kind of permanence, you know, of, of of the black box. But which which means which also which also means that the black box, you know, uh, well, it keeps, you know, its uh, well, it, its status. Well, to the extent that more and more, you know, it creates a kind of differentiation, so, you know, uh, meaning that uh, you you, m you must exactly know, you know, that you are going to see either a, bl a blockbuster or a semi-blockbuster or a semi-art film or an entirely artistic film, you know, and so. So this this is the case. This is the case. I think uh, this is to today. Uh, today, which which means which means yes, that so uh, that many films now uh, well are pushed, you know, many films which. Which are not formatted, you know, uh, for the, this kind of distribution, you know, are sent, you know, to to our to our to art uh, to art museums, you know, uh, and uh, well, uh, which of course, which of course uh, means uh, well, kind of means uh, well, a lot of problems, and not only a lot of problems, you know, about well, the form of temporal experience, you know, that is at the art of, at the art at the art of films, you know, and. Uh, and uh, well, uh, we, we we know that uh, well, there, there is a, as you know, uh, well, on, on, on the on the one end, you know, of course, uh, video works, video installations are, are, are have more or less, you know, uh, taken the taken the place of uh, paintings of paintings, you know, in art uh, in art centers, you know, this this means that well, it is uh, uh, it is uh, proposed, you know, as a kind of transformation a transformation for. For non-formatted, non-formatted, you know, films, you know, 
But of course, I don't think uh, don't think it is a solution. But I, but I think well, yes, it, it's a it's a real uh, it's a, it's a real trend today. Thanks. I think we have to round up here. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for the yeah, breathtaking lecture and the breathtaking question and answer. Thank you.